Welcome to the Mindset Mile podcast, the show that'll leave you empowered to take action towards becoming the turned up version of your already awesome self. I'm your host, Aisha Zaza, and I'm so glad you're here. Let's go. Hey fam, welcome back to another episode of the Mindset Mile podcast. I'm so pumped on our guest speaker today. We've got Christina Guzman on the show, who is the founder of Self Love Tonic. I'm going to let Christina explain all about the Self Love Tonic brand, but basically she empowers other people to live intentionally. She's a photographer and web and brand designer at Mara Creative Studio, and she is a mom of a two-year-old. She's just an all-around powerhouse, and I'm so, so excited to have her share a little bit about her approach to minimalism and what it's like to be a entrepreneur in this like creative space and just all about her journey um, with personal development. So Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I know I kind of just gave like a really rough intro to who you are, but I'm going to I'm going to let you take it from here. <laughs> Give us some background. Like tell us about you, what you do, how, why you're here. Go. So I am a former clinical social worker turned designer and photographer, like you said, working with our dear friend, Kristen at Mara Creative Studio. I am also the founder and podcast host at Self Love Tonic, which is a brand centered around empowering others to cultivate self-love, spread positivity, and step into their higher selves. And we recently just launched our Self Love Journal two weeks ago, which is something that was a true labor of love. And I'm super proud of, and it feels so good to have it out into the world. I'm also a minimalist wife and mama to our almost two-year-old daughter, which I can't believe the time goes by so fast. And we've been living outside of Nashville for the last two years. I am particularly fascinated today to talk about minimalism because this this is actually a topic that I have not, I kind of touch on on the show because I'm all about less is more. And I am constantly giving people ideas on how to like reduce mental clutter and maximize productivity. But I, I wouldn't call myself like a true minimalist, right? I know. And that's a scale. That's a sliding scale, right? Like I know that there's levels of minimalism, but let's talk about why you have chosen to live a minimalist lifestyle. And what does that even mean to you? So I started my minimalism journey I want to say about six years ago. And at the time I was feeling super overwhelmed with how much stuff I had, specifically how out of control my closet was. I remember any time that I'd have to go anywhere, I'd just sit on the floor in just sheer overwhelm and just stare at my clothes because it felt impossible to sift through and find what I needed. But in divine timing, as I was scrolling through Netflix one day, I noticed a documentary and it was called Minimalism a documentary about the important things. And after watching it, I felt such a connection to the people's stories. And I started to realize that minimalism might be what my soul has been searching for this whole time and what I was really desperately craving. So from there, I dove headfirst into all things minimalism. And through the documentary, I was introduced to Project 333. And the Cliff Notes version of what that is, is basically it's a capsule wardrobe of 33 items or less. And that includes shoes, hats, accessories. And then you take the rest of your wardrobe and you put it into storage and you work with only those 33 pieces for three months. So having struggled so much with my closet, I thought that was a really great place to start. And instead of putting the excess clothing in storage, I decided to take it up a notch for my own accountability and I actually donated all of it, which I pulling away, I was like, what did I just do? <laughs> yeah, I, was, move. I was, it was very, very, very bold, but uh, I really did want that extra accountability. And although it was hard at first, it ended up being the best thing that I could have done and the benefits were totally worth it. I found that I was doing less laundry or spending less time doing laundry each week. I was saving money by being more conscious about what I was bringing into my closet and the analysis paralysis that I was often getting caught up in that was gone. And 
after that, I was hooked. I wanted to apply this across the board in every area of my life because for the first time I was feeling a freedom and a weight being lifted that I had never felt before. And what I've learned along the way ended up completely transforming my mindset around consumption and leaning into intentional living. So I was going to ask, like, if where would you say the, the a good place to start is? But you kind of already addressed that it's probably your closet, right? W- would you suggest if someone is like kind of wanting to be a little bit more intentional and minimalist in their life, is their wardrobe a great place to start? Or w- is there another area that you would recommend? So there's different schools of thought on this. There's so many books and resources out there that have different plans and ways that you can start your journey with minimalism. In my experience, having started with the clothes, I would go back and do things differently. So what I usually recommend to people is instead of starting with something that you, and for clothes, for a lot of people, that is like the most overwhelming part. And that's the hardest part where people really struggle to let things go. Yeah. And it can be easy to get discouraged. And then people are like, hey, I'm not going to do this minimalism thing. So I like to tell people to start in the room where they spend the most time. So the reason that I say to do that is because you're going to feel the benefits of eliminating items and decluttering faster in the room that you spend the most time in rather than, you know, sometimes it's recommended start with the smallest space and then kind of go from there. And in terms of efficiency and being able to check something off the box, that's great. But in terms of actually really being able to tell, like, is this for me? Is this something that I want to start applying across my home, across my life? I always say start where you spend the most time because it's going to be the most apparent the benefits that you're going to feel as you're going through that process. So how would someone start eliminating things? Let's say they spend the most time in their living room. Like where do they even start? Let's let, I want to kind of break it down like micro, like step by step. Like, what do you mean get rid of things? Because in my, in my head, I'm kind of thinking someone would walk into their living room and be like, Oh, well, I don't have anything to get rid of because like all of these things are my things. And like, they're, they're mine and I want them or, you know, so where do you even start peeling back those layers? I always like to start with the no brainer items with the things that you already know off the bat that you're probably thinking about getting rid of anyways, things like, you know, broken toys, you know, ripped blankets, you know, worn out throw pillows, kind of that low hanging fruit, the items that are low stakes, because as you start getting rid of things, even if it's something that you were planning on getting rid of anyways, and you start to see it accumulate, you start to see more room, uh, more space open up, it starts to get a little more motivating. And then you start to look around and like, okay, like what else can I start eliminating that doesn't serve a purpose. It's not something that I feel like I'm using a lot because that's another thing too, is sometimes we save things, not necessarily because it serves a purpose now, but because it served a purpose in the past, or we think it's going to serve a purpose in the future. So I think a huge part of it, besides starting with those low stakes items, is also being honest with yourself about the about what the purpose is of the items in your space. And if it's something that's actually enhancing your life, or if it's something that's just taking up physical space and it's contributing to a greater feeling of clutter and overwhelm. That is so helpful. Would you, do you have a rule of thumb for like a timeline? Okay. Like, let's say I have not used this item in the last, is it six months? Is it year? Is it three months, like where is your scale? Like for someone that might be starting out where they feel kind of resistant, like, oh, I don't want to get rid of this because like I might use it, but it's been kind of a while, but like, I'm afraid that once I get rid of it, that's the second that I'm going to need it or want it again. So like what, what advice would you give someone that's kind of like, I don't know where to, that cutoff is. You know, the cutoff, it's going to be different for everyone. And that's something I want to touch base on later in this episode about really finding your own definition of minimalism and what that means for you and your family and what that can look like. But one of the things that I like to encourage people to do is instead of just getting rid of the items, you know, hold on to them for a little bit. 
put them in a box, put them out of sight. Because when you do something like that, you can kind of feel it out for a little bit. It might take you only a few days to realize, okay, I really need that back or I really don't need that at all. And I'm I'm happy that that's something that I'm getting rid of. But in terms of a timeline on how long it's been since you've used something, for me personally, I probably say if I haven't used it in two months, something to revisit. That's aggressive. Yeah. It is. It's a little it's a little aggressive, but it also depends on what the item is, right? Totally. Because something might be seasonal, mm-hmm. something might be, you know, if it's something that you were using with your baby and now they're a toddler, but you're pregnant and you're expecting another baby and you know, you don't need it immediately, but you know for a fact that you're going to have a use for it in the future. It kind of all depends on the item in the situation. But I think when we take a moment to really get honest with ourselves, like, well, when was the last time that I used it? And how many times have I used it? Mm -hmm. I think you start to intuitively feel like, all right, if I'm being honest with myself, I don't use it enough to warrant this staying in the space and taking up this room. Maybe I can sell it and actually, you know, make some money back. And that money can go, go towards purchasing something that does serve a purpose and does bring me joy. Or, you know, it can go to an experience that has nothing to do with physical items. I always remember Marie Kondo. You remember that show? Um, what was it called? Tidy, uh, tidying Up. Yeah. I think. Well, yeah. I, anyways, whatever her show was, something that I always remember and that I think is like so endearing is she would like have her clients like hold the thing that they were getting rid of and just thank the item for serving its purpose for however long it served its purpose. And then you can let it go. And that to me feels a little like, it feels kind of bittersweet, but also like you're honoring that it did mean something to you and it doesn't anymore. And you can just thank it and let it go instead of feeling like you need to hold on to it because everything has a memory of, to some extent, you know, but that doesn't mean that we have to keep it. I actually just went through my living room, which was starting to look like a playroom with my two kids. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start rotating my, my baby's toys, Oliver's 13 months now, but I was feeling like that sense of overwhelming clutter with just the way that our living room was starting to look and the amount of things that I was having to pick up every time he went down for a nap or at the end of the day, I cannot leave my house a mess. Like if I wake up to clutter like that, I will lose my actual mind. Right. And I think a lot of moms like feel this way, but maybe don't realize that the problem is like, there's too many things. And the same is true for our kids because what Oliver then was doing was he would make a mess of everything, pull it all out. And then he would look for like the next new mess and start of engage instead of engaging with his toys. So I was like, you know what? There's enough that like are similar items where I'm going to divide the toys and I'm going to rotate them every week so that his interest is peaked in them And when he has fewer things, he actually like sits and engages with those things because there's nothing more to undo. There's no more mess to be created. It's like, you've made your mess. Now you can like continue making it with these same things or that's it. Like we've got to teach our kids like how to be bored and how to figure out how to have fun with what they have instead of feeling like we're missing out on like the next best toy or the next best thing, you know? So even just doing that was so liberating for me. I was like, oh, like I feel so much lighter. (laughs) I felt happy that I was like committing to a plan. I told my husband about the plan. I said, you know, this is the basket for small toys or figurines. This is the basket for this. Like everything needs to have its home because I also want to teach my kids that like order, like keeping our things in order and visually pleasing is important. Not because I want to create like OCD, but because we take care of our things and this is how we clean up properly. Right. So, um, it's, it's really amazing. Like what just doing, like you said, like tackling just one thing, I then was inspired to be like, okay, what's the next cabinet or basket that I can organize. Right. And I think just breaking it down like that is a really helpful way for people to just embark on a little bit more of a minimalistic journey. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's overwhelming. The process can be very overwhelming. And there's a reason why we keep our stuff. 
like you said, you know, with Marie Kondo, you know, holding the item and showing your gratitude and letting it go, that's a bit of closure because there's an emotional element to it. It can be an emotional element for so many different reasons, whether it's a memory, whether you're just nostalgic, whether it belonged to someone that meant a lot to you. So those things are important to consider in that. So I love that you brought that up. And But it's funny that you say that about kids, about how you know, when they have so much stuff, it's almost like they get overstimulated because so do we. That's why clutter overwhelms us. That's why we hang on to things. That's why we struggle with that so much. And I love the fact that you're rotating toys out. That's what we're doing for my daughter, Mia, is every two to three months, we're kind of doing an audit of her toys. And it's hard too, because in those early stages, they're developing so fast that it's not like, you know, with a seven-year-old that probably by the time they're eight, they might still like the toy that you gave them when they were seven and it still applies. When they're so young, you're constantly switching out toys and clothes to match the developmental stage that they're in. And that in and of itself can be really overwhelming. So by doing those types of audits, by keeping things minimal, you're saving your own sanity, but you're also making it easier for your child to actually see what it is that they're playing with, to be able to focus, to be able to practice that repetition with these items to get the developmental um, benefits that that you're looking for them to get from those toys too. So I love that you do that. Well, and I, and I do that with my clothes too. You know, like I, I do feel like I have minimalistic tendencies for sure. Um, because I've always been, and I talk about this on the show, like I love selling clothes to Crossroads or like Buffalo Exchange, you know, and I, I kind of have like a one in one out policy. Um, if I'm buying something new that is relatively similar or similar, you know, or it's almost exactly the same as like something that I have that might be sl- like a slightly updated version, right? Because your style changes as you evolve and as you get older, and that's totally fine. Minimalism isn't about not buying things, right? Like that suit you. It's just about not hoarding all of it, feeling like there's going to be this urgent need for everything that you own. So you (laughs) must keep it all, you know, but I'm really big on like one in one out. We live in Santa Barbara that I, you know, which I absolutely love, but that also means we have an extremely small house and we're always working with super small storage quarters, including our closets. So I'm just constantly reevaluating like our things and like, what are we using? What are we not? We need to create space for like the urgent things. So I do feel like that is a common tendency of mine. It wasn't though, when I was younger, I actually used to be very attached to like items and things and it was super, super upsetting. So I've really enjoyed this process actually of like, as I've gotten older, like detaching myself a little bit from materialistic things. Like it doesn't, some things do hold a lot of value and I want to keep them, but most of the time I have a relatively easy time letting things go, which I appreciate. So tell us a little bit about some of the ways in which minimalism has um, changed like your mindset and how have these shifts happen in relation to the amount of things that you have or don't have anymore? Minimalism has definitely made me more self-aware. It's made me more aware of how my environment affects my mood and vice versa. It's been an anxiety decrease because there's less stimulation and overwhelm. It's made me more grateful for everything that I do have. It's helped me with flow and creativity in my space. And one thing that I wasn't expecting was that it actually helped me improve my finances because it made me really aware of my spending habits. And when you're not spending on autopilot anymore and you're thinking intentionally about your purchases, you're you're bound to save a good chunk of change. So that is something that I definitely didn't expect, but it's been probably one of the biggest benefits besides you know, the lifestyle benefits and, and the ease of, of maintenance in the space, just being able to save more money. Because when you look at all of the things that are in your home, every single item costs money. That represents a dollar value. And when you start thinking about when you're bringing things into your home that 
you know, maybe you did do it on autopilot. Maybe you're having a bad day and you decided to go shopping and you bought some shirts that you weren't really like in love with it. Or as Maria says, like it did not spark joy. <laughs> so, you know, you're just kind of hanging on to it just because it's there and you paid for it. So minimalism kind of helps you to stop and take a breath and be really intentional, not only about the things that you're eliminating or getting rid of, but like you said, being intentional about what you're consuming, what you're bringing back into your home. And I love what you were saying about the one in one out rule, because I have the same thing. You know, it's not that you can't buy things. There's no, there's nothing in minimalism that says that you can't buy things that you want or need. Like you don't have to justify it. But for me personally, personally, especially when it comes to wardrobe, the way that I've been able to keep it minimal and not go back to old habits, because it's it's a, a muscle flex. You have to keep flexing that muscle or else just with anything else, it's easy to go back into old habits. So I had that same rule of if I go and buy three shirts, most of the time I'm like, okay, what three shirts can I now get rid of? How can I replace this? And that's especially helpful, as you said, you know, you're going through different seasons of life. That mini dress that you really, really loved when you were 21 may not be the dress that you love anymore, <laughs> you know, when you're like 34. So it's good to be able to be honest with, with yourself in that sense. Um, so that's something that's been a huge weight off of my shoulders is just having those financial gains as well. And I also am super big on like, if it doesn't fit, I'm so particular now about the fit of clothes. I've, I can't tell you how many things I've held onto, um, but that didn't like fit exactly perfectly or like it would always slide off my shoulder or like come undone right here or, but I would like live with it. And it was so annoying to wear, but for some reason I felt like, but I like it enough to keep it or we're like, these are jeans that I want to hopefully like fit back into someday. And I would hold on to them as like a motivational thing. And like, that was also super toxic. I'm like, why am I holding on to clothes that don't fit my body properly? You know, like let all of that go. You, you just keep the things that fit you and are comfortable and that you actually like. I also just last thing, I don't, I don't mean to get on a tangent, but I really love what you're saying because also the things that I tend to buy are very similar. I'm not usually, you know, if there's an occasion where like I'm buying something that's for a special event, that might look drastically different than where what I wear on the regular. But for the most part, almost every single day, I would say six out of seven days a week, I'm reaching for a black long sleeve short shirt or a white like t-shirt with my same jeans. I wear the same jeans, right? Like we don't need 17 different pairs of jeans that you wear like once per year. So I feel like being realistic about like, what are the things I'm constantly gravitating to? That's like a good place to probably start in approaching like a minimalistic wardrobe is like, you don't need the 99 other things that you don't wear, right? Except for once every five years. Absolutely. No, that's a great point. And years ago, something that I did just as my own experiment, I did a garment rack challenge. I don't know if that's actually a thing. I may have made it up. I don't know. But it was along those lines of looking at my wardrobe, even having it scaled down, I really was only reaching for you know, the linen white shirts, the same kind of pair of jeans. I had a preference and a style. So there was this whole part of my closet that was going unused. So what I did was I got a garment rack, I put it in my room, and I took those pieces that I was wearing on a regular basis, and I would just plan my outfits for the week. And I would, you know, put those items on the rack, and that would be what I would pull from. And I would find that I would never step foot in the closet for anything else put those items. So that also makes it a lot easier to let go of some of those clothes because you're seeing proof right there from yourself, your own input that you're kind of forgetting about it. You're mm. not even worrying about it. Mm. I like that. And that's yeah, and that's the whole other thing with that project 333 is that you put the clothes out of sight out of mind. You don't have to get rid of them immediately like I did, but having them out of sight, it's out of mind and you start to realize that I don't actually need this. I'm actually good with this small, intentional amount of clothes. Or uh, in addition to that, you, you called that a garment 
challenge or what did you call it? Garment rack challenge. Garment I, sh- rack challenge. I shared it on social media a few years ago. It didn't quite catch on, but maybe it will now. <laughs> okay. Well, in like to couple this like garment rack challenge, I think, you know, what I also see people do online as well is like shop your actual closet. Like if there are things that you're kind of contemplating getting rid of or that you, the things that you, like you just said, are out of sight, out of mind, instead of like going to buy something new, challenge yourself to actually shop your closet. Because I feel like when we look at the same things every day, we don't see anything differently with like the same mindset, right? It's the mindset that needs to switch where then you can see the same things differently. So challenge yourself to actually shop your own closet and see if you can really make use of what you have before buying something new. I love that too. That That's a really good point. And I think sometimes you forget also about what you actually do have because it's two things, whether you haven't really been intentional in looking at what you have or your closet is so big at the moment that it's easy for things to get lost. That's a really good point. If you're shopping in your own closet, you kind of get reacquainted with things that you already have. And not only is it going to save you money from going to buy more things and bringing more into your closet, but it's also going to just make you feel like it's refreshed and you have something different to work with. One more question I have for you around this, because I think this is probably going to resonate with a lot of people. Do you find it challenging to be on social media in this age of like influencer everything and everyone and every item of clothing, right? Like this is how people make a living is to sell you their outfit. Do you find it challenging or like, how do you navigate being on social media and being tantalized by like all the the latest trends that people are linking? You and I have talked about this, but I, I have a very love hate relationship with social media. And I truly do think that if I wasn't a business owner, I probably wouldn't even have it because there are so many things that are thrown at us, not even just from influencers, but ads and businesses. Like it's so overstimulating and it is hard to not be like, oh, like that's the next shiny thing. I need to go get it. Or that's the new trend. So for me personally, one I try to be very intentional about the content that I'm consuming. So I don't tend to follow a lot of accounts that are specifically about fashion or the outfits or anything like that. Not that I don't value that, not that I couldn't use a few outfits myself, but for me personally, I found that it becomes harder to resist if that's what's in front of you constantly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, I always wonder you know, influencers who are fashion influencers, I'm like, their closets must be like so big (laughs) from like all the different, all the different clothes, whether they're doing brand deals or, you know, however it's structured. And, but even then I've seen like they do, you know, closet sales and periodically they're selling things out of their closet because they're trying to, you know, refresh it with the new items that are coming in. But I think social media in general, it can be something that's really motivating. But if we're not intentional with what it is that we're consuming, it can make it harder for us to stay focused on what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So in this case, you know, if it's minimalism, I try to follow accounts that not only are talking about minimalism and are helpful in terms of like the tips they're sharing, but it also feels like something that I resonate with. One thing that I feel like is a really big misconception about minimalism is that it's about perfection. It's about having like a perfect home and it's pristine at all times. And especially when you have kids, like that's just not the case. Like nine times out of 10, it's not the case. But the whole thing with minimalism is that the less stuff that you have, the easier it is to manage, the faster you're going to clean that up and it decreases the overwhelm. But sometimes I think the focus on social media of minimalism is about those perfect, pristine spaces that sometimes don't feel attainable for people or sometimes people, that's not what they want. You know, the stereotypical minimal home, which I I prefer, my aesthetic, you know me, you know my aesthetic is like neutrals, white, everything. That's what my house is going to be. But that is one picture of minimalism. It doesn't represent all of minimalism. So I would just urge people to, whether no matter what you're focusing on, 
fill your feed. If you're going to be on social media, fill your feed with the things that feel good, with the things that feel in alignment and with the things that you feel like are actually adding value and not making you play the comparison game yes. and aren't making you question yourself in a negative way where you're questioning your worth in any way. A hundred percent. I'm so glad that you are echoing this sentiment because I often give the tip of doing a social media audit and, you know, reference a lot of those points that you just made about how if you fall on account and the first thing that you feel is that you're envious in some way, or that it makes you feel like you don't have enough because this person is so beautiful and always so put together and they have it all and they must have so much money and they're their marriage must be perfect and blah, blah, blah. Like the list goes on, right? Like if those are your thoughts about the people that you're following, then you should probably unfollow them because that is not serving you. And while it feels like you're going to have FOMO, the second that you like want to hit that unfollow button, especially if it's an account that you do enjoy, but you are honest with yourself about this actually is bringing kind of like negative thoughts about either myself or the way that I feel about social media or the way I feel about them. Even there's someone I don't even know. And I'm having thoughts about them. Why is anyone taking up space in your mind that you don't know? Right? Like that is, should not be the case either, but there's this element of feeling like you're going to be missing out on something. If you're not seeing like their outfit of the day or like what they're linking. And it's like, I have unfollowed accounts And I've gone back and chosen to follow them thereafter because I'm like, oh, I kind of miss like a little bit of their aesthetic or a little bit of their, um, you know, whatever it is that I like about that person. It doesn't mean that it's bad, like you said, but like, do I need to be consuming it every single time I open my phone? Probably not. It's going to do wonders for your mental health to just do that, to do a a social media audit every now and again. I cannot recommend that enough. So I'm so glad that you said that. But since we're on social media, I want to ask you, are there any good accounts that you follow or that you recommend that are about minimalism besides your own, of course? Yes. So the first would be Project 333, what we were talking about, that initiative with the 33 items or less. Um, That's going to give you a lot of really great information, especially if you are looking to make some headway when it comes to your clothing in your closet. Another one is the Barta House, B-A-R-T-A. And I forgot where she lives, but her name is Heather. And she shares a lot of really uplifting and inspiring content about minimalism and how she got to the point that she's at with her three boys. And another one that I really enjoy that's actually a more recent follow, it's called Life Runs on Laughter. And it's like a mix of minimalism and intentional living. So I really like those accounts. Okay, awesome. I'm going to have to check those out when we're done. Thank you. I want to shift gears a little. Tell us about self-love tonic. Okay. So self-love tonic came about officially when I was in the postpartum period of fourth trimester. So I was really struggling with postpartum depression. I was really struggling with my self-worth and understanding who I was now as a mother. You know, people talk about how exciting it is, like you're bringing a baby into the world, like birth is happening, but there's also rebirth happening and you're being reborn into this new version of yourself. And although it's beautiful, it's also scary and it's uncertain. And there's just, there's so many things that go along with that, that people don't talk about enough. And I was in a really low point and something that I have always done throughout my life was to journal. And I did it when I was a kid. I used to love journaling. It was such a great way, especially, you know, going into my teen years to process some challenging things that were happening to me. Um, In my work as a clinical social worker, I was able to use it with the kids that I was working with in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. It's something that I believe in so much because I've been able to see both the professional and the personal benefits. But when I was pregnant, I didn't journal as much really at all. I had a high-risk pregnancy and it was one of those things where I was in and out of the hospital 
and in and out of doctor's appointments constantly. And then I was also working full time. So the last thing that I wanted to do was go write about my feelings (laughs) and try to process it that way. But in the postpartum period, I realized like, no, like I need to bring this practice back into my life because it is so profound and I I need to get out of this headspace because um, I really was afraid of the thoughts that I was having. And, you know, I was seeking, you know, help with mental health and therapy, but it's always good to have your own sounding board to get your thoughts out. And free journaling used to be something that I really enjoyed when I was younger. But as I've gotten older, I found that I wanted something that was more guided. I didn't want to have to constantly be coming up with things to write about. There's a time and a place for that. But years ago, I actually had developed my own guided journal because I couldn't find what I needed out on the market. And so I tried going back to my own journal and I was journaling for a few days. And I remember just kind of like slamming it down. I was like, this does not resonate anymore. Oh my gosh, my own journal that I developed doesn't resonate anymore. And it was that realization that in different seasons of life, we need different things to nourish ourselves, to nourish our soul, to really empower ourselves to keep moving forward. And although those prompts were serving me in a previous season, this was a brand new game that I needed to now consider something different. So I kind of went through that same process of, okay, well, what am I struggling the most with right now? I was really struggling with self-love. I was really struggling with clarity and knowing what I desired and what I really wanted my life to look like. I was struggling with limiting beliefs, and I was also struggling with committing to a personal development practice, you know, even though it was something that I had done for years not having done it as religiously in pregnancy and then having the postpartum depression, it definitely made it more difficult. So I knew that whatever prompts I needed, they were going to be in that realm. So I started kind of coming up with my own prompts and kind of testing them out on a daily basis. And the trick there was I didn't want to be writing for a half an hour, 40 minutes every day. Again, there's a time and a place for that. I wanted to have prompts that were deep enough that I felt like it was really moving the needle forward, but not so deep that I couldn't finish it in like 10 to 15 minutes. So after months and months, I finally started to get into a groove of prompts that I felt like I could do daily that were helping me to feel better about myself and my self-worth. They were helping me to reframe my limiting beliefs. They were helping me to affirm new truths so that it wouldn't be an issue moving forward. And just like with the last journal, once I realized the benefits, I knew I had to share it with people. So that's how the self-love tonic journal was born. Oh my gosh. I love that, Christina. I love your vulnerability and ability to just articulate how challenging that season of life can be postpartum. Because you're right, it isn't talked about enough. And I mean, I certainly felt unprepared the second time around, more so actually, ironically, than the first time. But I'm just so excited to, you know, invite people to take a look at Self Love Tonic, the brand, and you and explore just what it means to live intentionally. Because, like, what, when you stop and think about it, you're like, what is all of this rat race for? Like at the end of the day, what am I trying to like, why am I trying to be someone I'm not? Why am I trying, why am I putting myself down when I don't need to be? What, where is this voice coming from? You know, and when you start eliminating things in your life, you start just focusing more on what's in front of you than this arbitrary measuring stick of social media, you know, and like people and what they're wearing and where they're going and how they're living. It's like, stay in your lane. Like it's so much of a happier place to stay in your lane and want what you have instead of feeling like you need something more all the time. It's just, it's exhausting. And so I could not be more, I feel like this is such a perfectly timed conversation because I kind of feel this shift. I don't know, maybe that's a, um, I don't know where I'm, 
I don't have any data to reference, you know, that this is like actually happening, but I feel like people are hungry for more of this topic and are curious as to how to live with a little bit less, right? Like just slightly less than what they're living with currently to like reduce the the amount of overwhelm and decision fatigue and just come from a place of love, like having more abundance of love. Like that's how we can really show up as our best selves, which I believe is how we change the world, right? Like it's how we show up and like those little simple things and everything matters. Everything that we do matters. And that is exactly what you have made super clear in your in your approach to min- minimalism and developing the self-love tonic brand. So I just, where can people find you? Where can people find self-love tonic? So people can find self-love tonic at selflovetonic.com. That's where you can learn more about the brand in the journal. You can also learn more about the self-love tonic podcast. And on Instagram, we are at self-love tonic. And that's all we got going on because digital minimalism too. I'm not trying to be on too many, <laughs> too many well, platforms. Well, yeah. I am like Instagram only. I'm like, I don't have, no, not, there's no TikTok. There's no threads happening for me. We are, <laughs> I can barely even show up on Instagram sometimes. So I get it. <laughs> it's, it's hard. I do, I do technically have a TikTok, but the funny thing is I was off of it for a really long time. And when I logged back in recently, I realized one of my videos went viral and I didn't even know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's just, you were becoming yeah, famous. And it, was about min- it was about minimalism. So you're right that there's like a collective, you know, people are really interested. Yeah, absolutely. And what's your personal, can people follow your personal Instagram too? Did you want to share that? Yeah. So my personal Instagram is at it's Chrissy Jane and you'll see a mix of content on there from minimalism to just general intentional living, journaling, mom life, positive mindset. It's kind of a mix of a lot of things, but the overarching theme is definitely intentional living. Christina, thank you so much for everything that you have shared with us today. I'm obsessed with this conversation. I cannot wait to re-listen to this episode actually, because I want to, I want to process it just listening instead of talking. Cause I feel like you shared so many nuggets of wisdom that I can't wait to just apply in my own life. So I just enjoy you so much. I feel like you're such a light and such a positive influence. Everyone needs to unfollow all the <laughs> the influencers and follow you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. You're like so sweet. Thank person, you so much. You know what I mean. I just feel like I want people that share like real valuable like content. I'm just not here for like the the gram. Just you know, like you can tell when people are showing off just for the gram. I'm like, no, cut the BS. I'm I'm right there. I'm right there with you. And that's another reason why I don't post as often as I used to because. I've stopped to think, I'm like, why am I sharing this? What is the purpose of sharing this? Does it add value, you know? And um, that's been another way to be more intentional as well. But I'm right there with you. like, And I feel the same about you. I love your content. I love how real you are. And I love that you're not afraid to get vulnerable. And I think vulnerability is a superpower and the world needs more people like that. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, Christina, thank you so much. And I cannot wait to chat with you next time. And friends, I will see you next week. Until then, make it a great day.